Hello there. Thank you so very much for joining me for another reading of The Railway Children by E. Nesbitt. We're having a lovely time here, aren't we? What a charming story this is. And a seriously action-packed chapter last time. The amateur firemen, the children proving themselves to be extremely resourceful in a tight squeeze. I feel like every town and village should have their own Bobby, Peter and Phyllis on hand, just in case there's an emergency around the corner. Not only saving trains, but now saving burning barges and their occupants. They are a seriously impressive bunch. So very sweet, but believable, well-rounded characters as well, I think. Lovely to experience their journey, their adventures their trials and tribulations and everything in between. So of course, I hope you have a lovely time listening along to the next chapter. If you have any thoughts and feelings, anything you want to share, I really look forward to reading that in the comments. Chapter 9 The Pride of Perks It was breakfast time. Mother's face was very bright as she poured the milk and ladled out the porridge. I've sold another story, chickies, she said. The one about the king of the mussels. So there'll be buns for tea. You can go and get them as soon as they're baked. About eleven, isn't it? Peter, Phyllis and Bobby exchanged glances with each other. Six glances in all. Then Bobby said, Mother, would you mind if we didn't have the buns for tea tonight, but on the 15th? That's next Thursday. I don't mind when you have them, dear, said Mother. But why? Because it's Perks' birthday, said Bobby. He's 32, and he says he doesn't keep his birthday any more, because he's got other things to keep. Not rabbits or secrets, but the kids and the missus. You mean his wife and children, said Mother. Yes, said Phyllis. It's the same thing, isn't it? And we thought we'd make a nice birthday for him. He's been so awfully jolly decent to us, you know, Mother, said Peter. And we agreed that next Bunday we'd ask you if we could. But suppose there hadn't been a Bunday before the 15th? said Mother. Oh, then we meant to ask you to let us anti... antipate it, and go without when the bun day came. Anticipate, said Mother. I see, certainly. It would be nice to put his name on the buns with pink sugar, wouldn't it? Perks, said Peter. It's not a pretty name. His other name's Albert, said Phyllis. I asked him once. We might put A.P., said Mother. I'll show you how when the day comes. This was all very well as far as it went, but even fourteen halfpenny buns with A.P. on them in pink sugar do not of themselves make a very grand celebration. There are always flowers, of course, said Bobby later, when a really earnest council was being held on the subject in the hayloft, where the broken chaff-cutting machine was, and the row of holes to drop hay through into the hay-racks over the mangers of the stables below. "'He's got lots of flowers of his own,' said Peter. "'But it's always nice to have them given you,' said Bobby, "'however many you've got of your own. "'We can use flowers for trimmings to the birthday. "'But there must be something to trim besides buns.' Let's all be quiet and think, said Phyllis. No one's to speak until it's thought of something. So they were all quiet and so very still that a brown rat thought that there was no one in the loft and came out very boldly. When Bobby sneezed, the rat was quite shocked and hurried away, for he saw that a hayloft where such things could happen was no place for a respectable middle-aged rat 
that liked a quiet life. Hooray! cried Peter suddenly. I've got it! He jumped up and kicked at the loose hay. What? said the others eagerly. Why, Perks is so nice to everybody. There must be lots of people in the village who'd like to help to make him a birthday. Let's go round and ask everybody. Mother said we weren't to ask people for things, said Bobby doubtfully. For ourselves, she meant silly, not for other people. I'll ask the old gentleman too, you see if I don't, said Peter. Let's ask Mother first, said Bobby. Oh, what's the use of bothering Mother about every little thing, said Peter, especially when she's busy. Come on, let's go down to the village now and begin. So they went. The old lady at the post office said she didn't see why Perks should have a birthday any more than anyone else. No, said Bobby. I should like everyone to have one. Only we know when his is. Mine's tomorrow said the old lady, and much notice anyone will take of it. <laughs> Go along with you. So they went, and some people were kind, and some were crusty, and some would give and some would not. It is rather difficult work asking for things, even for other people, as you have no doubt found if you have ever tried it. When the children got home and counted up what had been given and what had been promised, they felt that for the first day it was not so bad. Peter wrote down the lists of the things in the little pocket book where he kept the numbers of his engines. These were the lists. Given a tobacco pipe from the sweet shop, half a pound of tea from the grocer's, a woolen scarf slightly faded from the draper's, which was the other side of the grocer's, a stuffed squirrel from the doctor. Promised a piece of meat from the butcher, six fresh eggs from the woman who lived in the old turnpike cottage, a piece of honeycomb and six bootlaces from the cobbler, and an iron shovel from the blacksmiths. Very early next morning, Bobby got up and woke Phyllis. This had been agreed on between them. They had not told Peter because they thought he would think it silly but they told him afterwards, when it had turned out all right. They cut a big bunch of roses and put it in a basket with the needle book that Phyllis had made for Bobby on her birthday and a very pretty blue necktie of Phyllis's. Then they wrote on a paper, For Mrs. Ransom, with our best love, because it is her birthday. And they put the paper in the basket and they took it to the post office and went in and put it on the counter and ran away before the old woman at the post office had time to get into her shop. When they got home, Peter had grown confidential over helping Mother to get the breakfast and had told her their plans. There's no harm in it, said Mother, but it depends how you do it. I only hope he won't be offended and think it's charity. Poor people are very proud, you know. It isn't because he's poor said Phyllis. It's because we're fond of him. I'll find some things that Phyllis has outgrown, said Mother, if you're quite sure you can give them to him without his being offended. I should like to do some little thing for him because he's been so kind to you. I can't do much because we're poor ourselves. What are you writing, Bobby? Nothing particular, said Bobby, who had suddenly begun to scribble. I'm sure he'd like the things, Mother. The morning of the 15th was spent very happily in getting the buns and watching Mother make A.P. on them with pink sugar. You know how it's done, of course. You beat up whites of eggs and mix powdered sugar with them and put in a few drops of cochineal. And then you make a cone of clean white paper with a little hole at the pointed end and put the pink egg sugar in at the big end. It runs slowly out at the pointed end, and you write the letters with it just as though it were a great fat pen full of pink sugar ink. The buns looked beautiful with AP on every one, and when they were put in a cool oven to set the sugar, the children went up to the village to collect the honey and the shovel and the other promised things. 
The old lady at the post office was standing on her doorstep. The children said good morning politely as they passed. Here, stop a bit, she said. So they stopped. Those roses, said she. Did you like them, said Phyllis. They were as fresh as fresh. I made the needle book, but it was Bobby's present. She skipped joyously as she spoke. Here's your basket, said the post office woman. She went in and brought out the basket. It was full of fat, red gooseberries. I dare say Perks's children would like them, said she. You are an old dear, said Phyllis, throwing her arms around the old lady's fat waist. Perks will be pleased. He won't be half so pleased as I was with your needle book and the tie and the pretty flowers and all, said the old lady, patting Phyllis's shoulder. You're good little souls, that you are. Look here, I've got a pram round the back in the wood lodge. It was got for my Emmy's first, that didn't live but six months, and she never had but that one. I'd like Mrs. Burks to have it. It'd be a help to her with that great boy of hers. Will you take it along? Oh! said all the children together. When Mrs. Ransom had got out the perambulator and taken off the careful papers that covered it and dusted it all over, she said, Well, there it is. I don't know but what I'd have given it to her before if I'd thought of it, only I didn't quite know if she'd accept of it from me. You tell her it was my Emmy's little one's pram. Oh, isn't it nice to think there is going to be a real live baby in it again? Uh, yes, said Mrs. Ransom, sighing and then laughing. Here, I'll give you some peppermint cushions for the little ones, and then you run along before I give you the roof off my head and the clothes off my back. All the things that had been collected for perks were packed into the perambulator, and at half past three, Peter and Bobby and Phyllis wheeled it down to the little yellow house where Perks lived. The house was very tidy. On the window ledge was a jug of wildflowers, big daisies, and red sorrel, and feathery flowery grasses. There was a sound of splashing from the wash house, and a partly washed boy put his head round the door. Mother's a-changing of herself, he said. Down in a minute! A voice sounded down the narrow, freshly scrubbed stairs. The children waited. Next moment the stairs creaked, and Mrs. Perks came down, buttoning her bodice. Her hair was brushed very smooth and tight, and her face shone with soap and water. I'm a bit late changing, miss, she said to Bobby. Owing to me having had an extra cleaning up today, along a Perks happening to name it's been his birthday. I don't know what put it into his head to think of such a thing. We keeps the children's birthdays, of course. But him and me, eh, we're too old for such like, as a general rule. We knew it was his birthday, said Peter, and we've got some presents for him outside in the perambulator. As the presents were being unpacked, Mrs. Perks gasped. When they were all unpacked... She surprised and horrified the children by sitting suddenly down on a wooden chair and bursting into tears. "'Oh, don't!' said everybody. "'Oh, please don't!' And Peter added, perhaps a little impatiently, "'What on earth is the matter? You don't mean to say you don't like it?' Mrs. Perks only sobbed. The Perks' children, now as shiny-faced as anyone could wish, stood at the wash-house door and scowled at the intruders. There was a silence, an awkward silence. "'Don't you like it?' said Peter again, while his sisters patted Mrs. Perks on the back. She stopped crying as suddenly as she had begun. 
There, there, don't you mind me. I'm all right, she said. Like it? Why, it's a birthday such as Perks never had. Not even when he was a boy and stayed with his uncle who was a corn chandler in his own account. He failed afterwards. <laughs> like it? <sighs> oh. And then she went on and said all sorts of things that I won't write down. Because I'm sure that Peter and Bobby and Phyllis would not like me to. Their ears got hotter and hotter and their faces redder and redder at the kind things Mrs. Perks said. They felt that they had done nothing to deserve all this praise. At last, Peter said, Look here, we're glad you're pleased, but if you go on saying things like that, we must go home. And we did want to stay and see if Mr. Perks is pleased too, but we can't stand this. I won't say another single word, said Mrs. Perks, with a beaming face. But that needn't stop me thinking, need it? For if ever... Can we have a plate for the buns? Bobby asked abruptly, and then Mrs. Perks hastily laid the table for tea, and the buns and the honey and the gooseberries were displayed on plates, and the roses were put in two glass jam jars, and the table looked, as Mrs. Perks said, Fit for a prince. To think, she said. Me getting the place tidy early and the little ones getting the wildflowers and all. Well, never did I think there'd be anything more for him except the ounce of his pet particular that I got a Saturday and been saving up for him ever since. Bless us, he is early. Perks had indeed unlatched the latch of the little front gate. Oh! whispered Bobby. Let's hide in the back kitchen and you tell him about it. But give him the tobacco first because you got it for him, and when you've told him, we'll all come in and shout many happy returns. It was a very nice plan, but it did not quite come off. To begin with, there was only just time for Peter and Bobby and Phyllis to rush into the wash house, pushing the young and open-mouthed Perks children in front of them. There was not time to shut the door, so that, without at all meaning it, they had to listen to what went on in the kitchen. The wash house was a tight fit for the Perks children and the three chimneys children, as well as all the wash house's proper furniture, including the mangle and the copper. Hello, old woman, they heard Mr. They heard Mr. Perks's voice say. Here's a pretty set out. It's your birthday tea, Bert, said Mrs. Perks. And here's an ounce of your extra particular. I got it a Saturday along of your happening to remember it was your birthday today. Good old girl, said Mr. Perks, and there was a sound of a kiss. But what's that pram doing here? And what's all these bundles? And where did you get the sweet stuff, and... The children did not hear what Mrs. Perks replied, because just then Bobby gave a start, put her hand in her pocket, and all her body grew stiff with horror. Oh, she whispered to the others. Whatever shall we do? I forgot to put the labels on any of the things. He won't know what's from who. He'll think it's all us, and that we're trying to be grand or... Charitable or something horrid. Hush, said Peter. And then they heard the voice of Mr. Perks, loud and rather angry. I don't care, he said. I won't stand it, and so I tell you straight. But, said Mrs. Perks, it's them children you make such a fuss about. The children from the three chimneys. I don't care said Perks firmly. Not if it was an angel from heaven. We've got on all right all these years and no favours asked. I'm not going to begin these sorts of charity goings on at my time of life. So don't you think it, Nell. Oh, hush, said poor Mrs. Perks. Bert, shut your silly tongue for goodness sake. The old three of them's in the wash house are listening to every word you speaks. 
Then I'll give them something to listen to, said the angry Perks. I've spoke my mind to them afore now and I'll do it again, he added. And he took two strides to the wash house door and flung it wide open. As wide, that is, as it would go, with the tightly packed children behind it. Come out, said Perks. Come out and tell me what you mean by it. Have I ever complained to you of being short, as you comes this charity lay over me? Oh, said Phyllis. I thought you'd be so pleased. I'll never try to be kind to anyone else as long as I live. No, I won't. Not never. She burst into tears. We didn't mean any harm, said Peter. It ain't what you mean so much as what you does, said Perks. Oh, don't, cried Bobby, trying hard to be braver than Phyllis and to find more words than Peter had done for explaining in. We thought you'd love it. We always have things on our birthdays. Oh, yes, said Perks. Your own relations. That's different. Oh, no, Bobby answered. Not our own relations. All the servants always gave us things at home, and to us, to them, when it was their birthdays. And when it was mine, and Mother gave me the brooch like a buttercup, Mrs. Viney gave me two lovely grass pots, and nobody thought she was coming the charity lay over us. If it had been glass pots here, said Perks, I wouldn't have said so much. It's there being all this heaps and heaps of things I can't stand. No. No one, neither. But they're not all from us, said Peter. Only we forgot to put the labels on. They're from all sorts of people in the village. Who put them up to it, I'd like to know, asked Perks. Why, we did, sniffed Phyllis. Perks sat down heavily in the elbow chair and looked at them with what Bobby afterwards described as withering glances of gloomy despair. So you've been round telling the neighbours we can't make both ends meet? Oh, now you've disgraced us as deep as you can in the neighbourhood. You can just take the old bag of tricks back where it come from. Very much obliged, I'm sure. I don't doubt but what you meant it kind, but I'd rather not be acquainted with you any longer if it's all the same to you. He deliberately turned the chair round so that his back was turned to the children. The legs of the chair grated on the brick floor, and that was the only sound that broke the silence. Then suddenly Bobby spoke. Look here, she said. This is most awful. That's what I says, said Perks, not turning round. Look here, said Bobby desperately. We'll go if you like. And you needn't be friends with us any more if you don't want. But we shall always be friends with you. However nasty you are to us, sniffed Phyllis wildly. Be quiet, said Peter in a fierce aside. But before we go... Bobby went on desperately. Do let us show you the labels we wrote to put on the things. I don't want to see no labels, said Perks, except proper luggage ones in my own walk of life. Do you think I've kept respectable and out of debt on what I gets, and her having to take in washing, to be give away for a laughing stock to all the neighbours? Laughing, said Peter. You don't know. You're a very hasty gentleman, whined Phyllis. You know you were wrong once before, about us not telling you the secret about the Russian. Do let Bobby tell you about the labels. Well, go ahead, said Perks grudgingly. Well then, said Bobby, fumbling miserably, yet not without hope in her tightly stuffed pocket. We wrote down all the things everybody said when they gave us the things, with the people's names, because Mother said we ought to be careful, because... 
but I wrote down what she said. And you'll see. But Bobby could not read the labels just at once. She had to swallow once or twice before she could begin. Mrs. Perks had been crying steadily ever since her husband had opened the wash house door. Now she caught her breath, choked, and said, Don't you upset yourself, Missy. I know you meant it kind if he doesn't. May I read the labels? said Bobby, crying onto the slips as she tried to sort them. Mother's first. It says, Little clothes for Mrs. Perks's children. Mother said, I'll find some of Phyllis's things that she's grown out of if you're quite sure Mr. Perks wouldn't be offended and think it's meant for charity. I'd like to do some little thing for him because he's so kind to you. I can't do much because we're poor ourselves. Bobby paused. That's all right, said Perks. Your ma's a born lady. We'll keep the little frocks and what not, Nell. Then there's the perambulator and the gooseberries and the sweets, said Bobby. They're from Mrs. Ransom. She said, I dare say Mr. Perks's children would like the sweets, and the perambulator was got from my Emmys first. It didn't live but six months, and she's never had but that one. I'd like Mrs. Perks to have it. It would be a help with her fine boy. I'd have given it before if I'd have been sure she'd accept of it from me. She told me to tell you, Bobby added, that it was her Emmy's little one's pram. I can't send that pram back, Bert, said Mrs. Perks firmly, and I won't, so don't you ask me. I'm not asking anything, said Perks gruffly. Then the shovel, said Bobby. Mr. James made it for you himself. And he said, Where is it? Oh, yes, here. He said, You tell Mr. Perks it's a pleasure to make a little trifle for a man as he's so much respected. And then he said he wished he could shoe your children and his own children like they do the horses. Because, well... He knew what shoe leather was. James is a good enough chap, said Perks. Then the honey, said Bobby in haste, and the boot laces. He said he respected a man that paid his way, and the butcher said the same, and the old turnpike woman said many was the time you'd lent her a hand with her garden when you were a lad, and things like that came home to roost. I don't know what she meant. And everybody who gave anything said they liked you. And it was a very good idea of ours. And nobody said anything about charity or anything horrid like that. And the old gentleman gave Peter a gold pound for you and said you were a man who knew your work. And I thought you'd love to know how fond people are of you. And I never was so unhappy in my life. <sighs> Goodbye. I hope you'll forgive us some day. She could say no more, and she turned to go. Stop, said Perks, still with his back to them. I take back every word I've said contrary to what you'd wish. Nell, set on the kettle. We'll take the things away if you're unhappy about them, said Peter. But I think everybody'll be most awfully disappointed as well as us. I'm not unhappy about them, said Perks. I don't know, he added, suddenly wheeling the chair round and showing a very odd-looking, screwed-up face. I don't know as ever I was better pleased. Not so much with the presents, though they're an A1 collection, but the kind respect of our neighbours. That's worth having, eh, Nell? I think it's all worth having, said Mrs. Perks. And you've made a most ridiculous fuss about nothing, Bert, if you ask me. 
No, I ain't, said Perks firmly. If a man didn't respect hisself, no one wouldn't do it for him. But everyone respects you, said Bobby. They all said so. I knew you'd like it when you really understood, said Phyllis brightly. <sighs> You'll stay to tea, said Mr. Perks. Later on, Peter proposed Mr. Perks' his health, and Mr. Perks proposed a toast, also honoured in tea, and the toast was, May the garland of friendship be ever green, which was much more poetical than anyone had expected from him. Jolly good little kids, thus said Mr. Perks to his wife as they went to bed. Oh, they're all right, bless their hearts, said his wife. It's you that's the aggravatingest old thing that ever was. I was ashamed of you, I tell you. You didn't need to be, old gal. I climbed down handsome soon as I understood it wasn't charity. But charity's what I never did abide. And I won't, neither. All sorts of people were made happy by that birthday party. Mr. Perks and Mrs. Perks and the little Perkses by all the nice things and by the kind thoughts of their neighbours. The three chimneys children by the success, undoubted though unexpectedly delayed of their plan. And Mrs. Ransom, every time she saw the fat Perks baby in the perambulator. Mrs. Perks made quite a round of visits to thank people for their kind birthday presents, and after each visit felt that she had a better friend than she had thought. Yes, said Perks reflectively. It's not so much what you does as what you means. That's what I say. Now, if it had been charity... Oh, drat charity, said Mrs. Perks. Nobody won't offer you charity, Bert, however much you was to want it, I lay. That was just friendliness, that was. When the clergyman called on Mrs. Perks, she told him all about it. It was friendliness, wasn't it, sir? said she. I think, said the clergyman. It was what is sometimes called loving kindness. So you see it was all right in the end. But if one does that sort of thing, one has to be careful to do it in the right way. For, as Mr. Perks said when he had time to think it over, it's not so much what you do as what you mean. Thank you so very much for listening. Oh, the poor kids there getting a real hammering from Perks. I really felt for them. You've got to feel for Perks as well, though. He was obviously extremely conflicted with what that gesture meant and how it made him look in the eyes of his peers. This was, of course, a very traditional time and... Charity, as they put it, or anything resembling charity was obviously something that could seriously affect how someone would feel they fit into society, their social standing, their status, how they would be looked at and treated and all the rest. And Perks is obviously very proud that although he's a relatively poor working person, he is a working person after all. And he is trying his absolute hardest to provide for himself and from his wife and for his children. Um, but the children were absolutely adorable there, of course. And how lovely, really, that they opened up um, a part of that community that maybe hadn't been seen before or hadn't been seen for a very long time, perhaps, or very rarely demonstrated 
where so many people actually wanted to come together and make that birthday special for Perks, who is, generally speaking, a very nice chap and a valued part of that community. Up next will be Chapter 10, The Terrible Secret. I'm really eager for it. I hope you are too. Do come and join me for that one. We've got five chapters to go. We've already had a lot of excitement. We've had a lot of beautiful moments. We've had calm. We've had thought-provoking, relaxing, sweet scenes that put a smile on the face and pull at the heartstrings. And I feel that things are certainly going to get even juicier very soon indeed. The terrible secret. What will it be? You take care, wherever you are and whatever you're up to. I hope you're doing very well indeed. Read to you soon.